Hello, everybody. Welcome to, uh, I think it's number 17 of our webinar series for the Center for Artistic Activism. Um, Steve is in Mexico right now, so he's not with us. It's going to be me and uh, Terry Marshall. Um, but before we get to Terry, we have been, we just got back from Guinea in West Africa. This is a, a photo of the end of the performance that. Uh, the group did as their like example action. So what we do is like a few days of teaching some of the things that we teach in these webinars. And then we um, we do an action and we kind of put it into practice. And in this case, it was this very funny um, sort of stage show about corruption in West Africa. And um, we call it the Arts Action Academy. So there's a graduation at the end. And you can see Steve and me and Rebecca there. And then Ibu is on the left. Ibu is from Open Society Institutes West Africa who helped us organize it there and one of our proud graduates. So we're, we're just back from there and um, I'm still on malaria medication and uh, I don't have malaria, it's preventative. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it was a, quite a journey, hours and hours of flights, like I think 20 hours of flights, and three stops um getting there and back but we're back now and um i want to welcome terry marshall terry if you could show your face that would be wonderful um because i'm gonna say a lot of nice things about you and we want to see you um <laughs> smile <laughs> um, so terry and his partner aisha um founded intelligent mischief in 2014 terry came to that prior uh, being a union organizer for SEIU 1199, the largest healthcare workers union in the country, in the world. In the world. <laughs> yeah, yes. On this planet. Um, and has worked with the Center for Story-Based Strategy, which does a lot of great work, um, and the de design studio for Social Intervention, which is based in Boston, which is a great organization and has worked with the movement net lab. Terry also um, founded Occupy Comics during Occupy Wall Street. And whenever I have a question about comic books, Terry is like one of the people that I go to to ask. Um, <laughs> he is also an alumni of our programs and a board member of the Center for Artistic Activism. Um, and we were talking earlier about being a nerd and how much of a liability that used to be. <laughs> and uh, so you, you, you were a nerd as a kid. Do you mind showing that photo again? <laughs> this, but this, this is, um, you know, when you see this, you don't think nerd immediately. You, <laughs> you know, a nice guy. Nice guy, had to take, had to take a, um, you know, picture when my mother was 15. Right. Yeah. And you did the sun, it. Sun duties. <laughs> yeah. You were, you were nice about it. But back then you were reading lots of comic books. Yes. Did you, yep. were you a Star Trek person? Uh, I was, I was a huge Trekkie from when I was five. From the time I was five years old, I was watching Star Trek, the old original Captain Kirk, uh, Mr. Spock, um, into Doctor Who on okay. <laughs> GBH here in Boston totally into comics and my first comic I ever got was around X-Men and it was particularly starring Storm who was the leader of the X-Men at the time. The only wow. real true leader. So you have more credibility than I do. <laughs> I still have never seen a whole episode of Star Trek. What? <laughs> yeah. That, I mean to. Sense. I mean to. There was a point <laughs> where it was like defiance but no. <laughs> Negligence. I, I need to do that. Um, but who knew that the kid in that picture would later be at the WTO protests in Seattle and at Occupy Wall Street and at the protests in Ferguson? Yes. You are one of the few people that has the triumvirate of yes. American, recent American uprisings. Yes. You were there. What is the common denominator people ask? There's been papers written about it. They don't know the answer. The answer is Terry Marshall. <laughs> and, and with that, the NSA and FBI has just tuned in. <laughs> like we figured it out, finally. 
<laughs> All this time. This is the guy. <laughs> this is the guy to watch. <laughs> well, um, <coughs> it's always fun to talk to you. Um, and and uh, we're going to talk about intelligent mischief and the work that you've been doing as intelligent mischief. Yes. So what do we need to know before we start? Oh man, before we start, dang. <laughs> yes, <we're> pre. <laughs> um, uh, so, so background, um, tells mischief, you know, like, like, you, thank you for your introduction. Um, I've been doing uh, grassroots work, radical organizing work from the time I was like about 17. And um, all that time, I always involved like culture and like events and into my organizing and around 2013 2014 i i just come to a conclusion of like the type of organization i felt was needed and i felt it wasn't necessarily an organization it was more like a lab we needed a, a space to experiment um because i thought traditional organizing was just kind of stuck in in a rut and a lot of tools i was using uh ideas i would get from pop culture and culture in general but like the more cultural tools I was using, I felt like there needed to be a space where like, okay, we need to figure out fine tune these and how it could help make organizing more effective. And I started, uh, so I started it up and it was originally, um, originally there was about four of us, um, you know, uh, Kalik Williams and Chris Lynn Dejan, who also part of Tells Mischief, but um, they've also gone on to do other things. This, they're still part of the overall team, but the day to day and actually running um, is uh, me and Aisha Schillingford. Yeah. So um, the what was one of your first experiments? Like, what were you eager to get started with to try out? One of the, one of the very first experiments, we've had this theory about doing uh, doing work in in the nonprofit field, right? Non nonprofit complex uh, doing work in the marketplace and also doing work in um, in the public. And what's, yeah. what's the differences there? Um, and we wanted to test out like we wanted to test out the differences and show like uh, what we thought was really effective is like when you do work in the public, right? It just directly you know, dealing with the public. And one of the things about that was uh, looking at cultural examples of that was um, graffiti. And so we found this um, we found this sort of like this loophole. So I was based I found it in Boston, and uh, in front of the state house there was something that happened because of a few protests that happened. There was some legal precedent that s allowed the front part of the state house was like no one, the city or no one else did have jurisdiction over that. So he's like, oh, you don't need a permit to do anything there. So we got, we asked people around town, like the question about what if Boston, right? What, what To ask people to imagine, to get them to imagine like how Boston could be different, how Boston could be more liberatory. We say, what if Boston had this? What if Boston had that? And we asked 50 organizers and they gave us answers. And then we got some chalk, uh, chalk spray paint um and did those and then like we called it like a do yourself arts festival and we kind of spray painted those uh questions that was the very first action and the police so <laughs> alerted the police and the police surrounded me um but like they detained me for like 20 minutes trying to just figure out was this illegal he's like it's actually not <laughs> it was like because it was chalk they didn't know what to do and they finally had to let us keep doing it so between the chalk and the like special legal zoning of that area you were in the clear yeah <laughs> i love that stuff man i like my favorite thing is to be able to do something and be like yeah i did it can't, you can't touch me <laughs> yeah, yeah it's pretty amazing they don't found it <laughs> so good experiment good experiment <laughs> um so tell me about the black body survival guide you sent us some of these pictures mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah. Uh, so Black Body Survival Guys, so that's like one of our first big uh, projects we did, right? Like what we normally do, we kind of divide up our time in like consulting grassroots organizations on how to use, tap into pop culture, how to use design baking, how to use narrative to uh, make the organizing more effective. And we also said like, you know, we said like, we talk about nonprofit, we talk about market, we talk about public. Uh, we also believe in entering the market, the market because the market reaches many people and we're like trapped in all different types of markets, right? Due to the economic system we're in. So we also feel that people on the left have to be creative and actually contend for space within the market. So with that, we produce products that we think will um, contend this is, for- This is making me really uncomfortable. What are you saying? This is making me really uncomfortable. <laughs> and that's the goal. 
because <laughs> <laughs> we need we need to get out of our comfortability in order to achieve um, achieve liberation. Honestly, um, yeah. So we you know we produce products that we believe will um, create culture shift, right? So one of the products ended up being um, this called a Black Body Survival Guide. And when I came about was uh, it was a result of uh, the the killing of Trayvon Martin and you know people and specifically uh, his killer uh, being let off by the state wow. and seeing the shock of that and um, I had wrote this Facebook post that was like wow like you, you know I heard uh, an interview with one of the jurors and they said that basically they had said that they didn't think that Trayvon Martin did anything wrong but they felt that. Uh, his killer was a very good man that just wanted to protect them, like them as in like white folks and folks who own property and such, right? Yeah. So it was like black people was just like collateral damage for that because they're just afraid of black people. So yeah. we was like, oh wow, the 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 racism in this is becoming so blatant, right? And along with the other police killings that's been happening uh, in the last decade. So um, you know, we came up with this term. It was like when reality gets absurd, it's time to get surreal because we just felt like we can't. The, the arguments that the police give and the state gives for like the killings on our black people um, was just so absurd. It was like, you can't combat it with facts, right? So we we turned to surrealism, Afro-surrealism in particular. And, and we just said, well, okay, let's be surreal. Like if you, these, these answers, these explanations are so absurd, if you just follow the logic, then it was like, well, obviously it's always the black person's fault. It's always the unarmed person's fault of why they got killed. So what what would you do in that case, right? If that's the reality, what would you do? And it was like, well, black people just need some tips to help them not get themselves killed, right? And we was like, yeah, like a survival book. And, you know, and, and uh, me and some other folks, uh, particularly um, Chris and Dijon and, and uh, Malia Zoo, some other folks came and was like, hey, let's, uh, we started thinking about, hey, like, let's, uh, let's really, really actually do that, right? Let's make a survival book. And we also like tap again, pop, tap into pop culture. There was the uh, zombie, survive, the zombie apocalypse survival guide. Right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like, we should, we should, let's like, let's follow that, right? It was kind of like, that was the reason for like a book, right? It was like, it was already, already precedents. Uh, people found, were familiar with survival guides. Right, and this like sort of book and go camping and stuff like that. So it was just to add on to that. And we started like we started doing hacks where we started crowdsourcing tips from people. Like think of these ridiculous tips if this is the reality. You know, we were we went around doing that. And then um we came up with this sticker. Um, this is one of the tips that came out. It was like only wear your hoodie at home. And you know, we make a random number, like it could be any number of tips. And it was like, yeah, it's like ridiculous. Like that's the level that is at. <laughs> Yeah, you gave me one of these, and there's some really funny stuff in there. Um, like, so this card is, is this part of, the, or this is in the book, and then you can get a card. Yes, yep. And the card, so came, go ahead. Yeah. So this card, like, I would, I'd be a signatory for you. Like, yep. I'll cover your loan if it was a signatory for a loan, but in this case, it's for your safety. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's so that people get a chance to read it. We 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 have tons of these cards left, so people could um, order them from us. Only <laughs> one at tellsmission.com. Um, this card actually. So we have a tip. We have a tip in the book that was like every black person should have a white co-signer. And um, you know, like you said in the introduction, I work closely with Center for Story Based Strategy and Felicia Perez, who um, is the R and D person at Center for Story Based Strategy, really wanted to help out with stuff with the book. It was like. Hey, we could take that tip and like start to make it like, you know, this real life prototype or whatever. And she helped design the card and sent sent them to us. And we was like, okay. And we did a day, we did an action on Facebook where one day we tagged like white allies and said, Hey, will you please be my co-signing? <laughs> and had people pass around the cards. And like people, you know, it's just like it's it's one of the things where we use what we call diegetic prototypes, um, taking like what fiction that? diegetic prototypes. Yeah. That's when you take um you take something that's like a narrative, like you just let's say you create a narrative or you create fiction and then you prototype it, you make it real. Right. Um and, and so we were talking about this in the last podcast with the um we had a couple people that had studied future future studies, right? Mm -hmm. And they would talk about bringing artifacts from the future from different theoretical futures. Yep. Anyway, yep. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And this was like um one of the first tests in doing that. Like we was like, oh, how, if that tip was real, it would manifest itself in this like survival card. 
So we was handing out these cards, and that that began a process of um, creating uh, real life prototypes of um, from the book. Now, have you ever used one of these in real life? No, not yet. It has not been tested <laughs> in interactions with uh, police or any other member of the state or vigilantes. No. <laughs> I wonder if it would like be just weird enough and funny enough that it could break the the some sort of tension. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and someone should use it. <laughs> so I, was like, I was like, no, I'm gonna say encourage, but I want liability, but we're just saying, this is a tool that people can do something with. So <laughs> tell me about this I Am Not a Threat shirt. Uh, I'm Not a Threat shirt, we had, at one point early on in the book, we hired a, a young artist named Cole Williams, who did some mock-up sketches for us. Uh, this was one of them, it was just like another tip. These are all, tips like crowdsource for like we did four or five hacks like hackathons like yep. brought people together um the young black people said hey let's go we took them through a design process and was like come up with some tips what's like your wild imagination of like ridiculous tips for black people and right. one was like you know a lot of these shirts like we like the first shirt we made a lot of those shirts started to become popular saying the names of um people murdered by the state or by vigilantes so we was like uh, another form of t-shirt be say like yeah, black person should be walk around with their hands up saying like just a warning sign like i'm not a threat we like you always have to like profusely apologize for being basically right 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 um cool what's this one uh oh this was also white co-signer this white co-signer yeah. co co it was multiple ways white co-signers can um uh, manifest. So one was like actually having someone sign your card and being ready to take a phone call. Another one was uh, have a, a blown up white doll all, always at hand for like uh, such things as maybe a job interview or um, you know go and try to get mortgage or something like that. Um, white cosigns very much come in handy in this society. And uh, if you want to blend in, apply white face. <laughs> Yes, in a reversal of blackface. Um, they're also something we thought come very handy, you know. Um, again, we're just going by the logic of what the police say and the vigilantes say of the reasonings right. for people being killed. So it's like the logical extension of things that they've already claimed. Claimed. And, and, and the, whole the, <laughs> the whole they point the show, the whole point of the absurdity. Let's say again. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I got you. <laughs> so tell us about this one. Uh, this one came from a tip that was like, yeah, black people should carry as many um, IDs as possible, right? To like, uh, you know, this is also, uh, you could relate this to um, the the whole truther, uh, the truther, like birther movement around Obama, yeah. right? Like, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. President of the United States said, you, you need your papers, you need certification. So uh, all the way from that to like the average black person on the street, like just, you know, we, we would design a wallet <laughs> that would carry like a trillion, different IDs. Um, super interesting story about this is that we actually, um, unbeknownst to us around the same time, um, another uh, woman named um, Kara, Kara Mitchell, who is um, an architect and designer from um, Harvard School, Harvard Graduate School of Design, um, young black woman. Uh, for her thesis, she designed something. She actually designed a wallet that had, um, that looked exactly like this. We did not know about each other. She had a very similar idea. And then someone, a couple of people finally connected us. And we actually had a, a, a art exhibit of a Black Body Survival Guide at Boston University last year. And she sent us everything she designed. So she, we actually had that real wallet in the art exhibit. But you're awesome. making products, like you could make the wallet, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you, so you're looking for investors? Yes. Okay. Up there, it's very putting much it out into the universe. Yes, please do. Okay. <laughs> um, That's where you come uh, in handy as a white cosigner, Steve. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, and then this was your other tips, which is like just keep your hands up at all times. Keep your hands up all times, and you in this you see um, how hard that is to do. <laughs> just <laughs> Everyday life, taking a shower, trying to eat ice cream, uh, using the bathroom, um, everything, working out, all this stuff. It was just like, yeah, it, it also dwells into like, uh, when you, you look at this and see the absurdity and see like, that's just impossible. And, and also think about 
these are in the same time these are actual reasons why people were killed like people didn't put their hands up in time or so which is just ridiculous and you see like the the literally day-to-day -day difficulty for black people or the struggle that black people go through like that like that's impossible yet that's what's being people being told to do and then people are dying as a result right. so it, it serves like the project serves like um yeah like different purposes so there's part of this that is like not funny at all right mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet you are being very funny about it why mm -hmm. why like why one we just felt like you know like we said at the beginning like it, it's like reality the reality is absurd the reality is funny right it's it's like stark and sad and at the same time ridiculous like um you know as as a black person <laughs> you spend a lot of time actually laughing and making fun of racism because you know how ridiculous it is right and in other systems of oppression so we wanted to create a product that actually reflected that that showed um people's like innate knowledge of that at the same time so uh we felt it was a, like a super effective tool because it was logic when some like you said like when something becomes so absurd like logic just wasn't helping just the facts weren't helping so we had to use humor we had to use uh surrealism um to combat it to expose it because it was the the logic is like hiding the the logic that's being used is hiding the reality so we wanted to use the the laughter and the surrealism to um to expose the reality to lift the veil i'm thinking of like how an inside joke works among a circle of people mm -hmm. right are mm -hmm. you like trying to reinforce an inside joke reinforce an inside joke and bring it out at the same time because in the form of a book, uh, we said, you know, it's not published yet, but um, we've gone around doing workshops. We've been in demand. We've been talking to publishers. Um, we've been in articles. This, by putting it out, right, is an inside joke that gets reinforced, but at the same time, by putting it out, it's, um, it's exposing what's going on, right? It's like bringing, it's making, facing, it's forcing other people to face that reality as well. You know, and that's what we've, we've talked about, like, when we thought about the audience for this, we was like primary audience is like is like black folks, right? And folks like directly experience, having these experiences. Um, a secondary or you know other people of color, uh, secondary uh, audience would be like white allies, right? People who who are white who have you know uh, suffer from like white privilege who benefit from these things even if they don't want to, but um, would also see this and be like, huh, like this. It might be a way of like opening up conversations or helping like expose people um, to to things that go on. Right? We're not thinking of people who are like um, not super advanced politically. We're thinking like everyday people. It was also using humor too in a book format. Um, we we wanted something that wasn't. It didn't just stick in the same circles. We want like the average everyday person who's not politically engaged to be able to like maybe read this, maybe laugh. It, usually, what happens to everyone is that they look at it, they go ha ha ha. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. I remember having that reaction. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and we felt like, you know, we, we have a theory about transformational experiences, and we feel like people are transformed. The people's consciousness is shifted and culture shifted uh, through experience and not, not just like reading something, right? It was like, right. well, how can we develop something that would cre create an affect to that person to make them like think differently? So you're describing the ha 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 oh that's the experience that you're trying to have. Yep. People have. Yep. And for now on, it will be known as the ha 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 oh experience. Thanks to you, okay. Steve. <laughs> we need to translate it into Latin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, before we were talking about, well, one thing I guess I'll ask first is. Um, you turn this into a book you've turned it into stickers like how do you choose the medium for this why not like it seems like you could perform this you could um you could put it online it could i'm sure you've put it online but mm -hmm. like why a book how do you choose the method of getting this out how do you make those choices so what we actually did so the book idea originally the book idea originally uh just came from looking at like pop culture, like we said, the zombies of uh, apocalypse survival guide and thinking of the word survival 
and how people associate that and, and thought people just through the word association, the medium they associate that quickly enough was a book. Um, that was the first idea. Then we sat down and we actually did a design process called Scamper um, that we use in-house. And, um, and you know, it's basically like, it forces you, usually as organizers, especially we, we're used to like, okay, we got this one idea, then we run with it, right? You do it and you stick with that and you just try to run it to the ground. And we actually love using design process because it makes you think like, there's actually a million different ways you could get something done. And there's probably ways you're not looking at that'd be more effective, right? But you have to be open to like all the options. So Scamper allowed us to come up with uh, about 100, 150 different mediums that we could do. And we said, well, instead of this, we don't have to, uh, it, it's not like do this instead of this. It was more like these are different ways. So we started calling the Black Lives Survival Project overall like multi it was a multimedia project so it was a book there's gonna be stickers it, we have a video we we did an online video that we made for um our um indiegogo campaign to fundraise for it um and we you know like i said we was um uh boston university uh, last year we was in an art show and we had the art exhibit where we create the black lives survival store and we create the black lives survival asians office that was like behind the store it was these eight foot uh tall walls and we just like put all the products we actually that was further we got to create a life-size diegetic prototype of the storyline from the book and the narrative it was creating wow um i want to open it up to questions we've got a lot of people that are escaping maybe from their families right now <laughs> and they'll be like i have this important meeting i have to get to online uh you can't let me hide in this extra bedroom <laughs> um, but if they have uh, questions to send them through in the chat and we will pass them along. Um, so if you have those, send them in. Um, but I was going to say, like, the, you're also working with risk, right? Like when you put out um, these messages or like the something that is a joke and a sort of a satire, there's mm -hmm. always a risk that people will take you seriously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right and uh and also i think that when you're experimenting too that it it might not work right like that you could try something that backfires but also that um that is misunderstood or it just doesn't land the way that you want it to like how do you think about that kind of risk or like being misunderstood does that is that something that happens? Does that get incorporated into the design process? Mm. Yeah, we when we're doing the design process, we uh, like we calculate that as risk, right? But in our mission statement, we put that part of the purpose. The one of the main purposes of intelligent mischief is uh, to experiment. Um, so we consider everything we put out as a risk because it's an experiment. So like failure is not feared failure is actually expected um love, uh, the black rice about god project like luckily that uh, from the time we put that out people were so receptive there, there was always early on it, like pre as i could mark this like pre ferguson there was a lot of people who did not get it um oh. like black people always got it <laughs> but outside of that people were like always like I'm not supposed to laugh at that. Oh. <laughs> right. And then there was something about post Ferguson, like people just started getting it. People started getting it no matter who. Um, did so, they need like a cue to know that it was okay to laugh at? Say again? Like, did they need a cue to know that it was okay to laugh at? A lot of times in those situations, I, I always would say like, it's okay to laugh at that. Like, <laughs> I'm getting, I would just straight up say that. <laughs> it was wow. like, you need someone to tell you it's okay. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was always super interesting. Um, but it's funny that it took it getting in a way. Uh, not that it got worse. I think it was always like bad, but maybe more visibly worse for people right. to feel like it was absurd enough. Like your point about absurdity, I think, is even stronger. Then you know that like when Ferguson came out, then people felt like they could laugh at it because it was just like this is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cause there's something about Ferguson. There's something about like people openly being rebellion that just says enough is enough. And 
And I think that gave a lot of people, I don't know if that just gave people permission too to be like, yeah, we 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 really can't take what the police are saying seriously. At this point, you can't even like consider it. Like yeah. before it was like, I guess you might have to consider their reasons. And it was just like, Ferguson was like, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah, we yeah, don't yeah. have to consider that. No, just stop. <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah. So, um, uh, oh, we got a question from uh, from Rebecca, our, <laughs> our Center for Artistic Activism, Rebecca. She said she wants to know more about Afrofuturism and Wakanda Con <laughs> and what costume you'll wear and what do you recommend people wear? What is Wakanda Con? <laughs> so that's a that's a new big project that we're starting to enter on. Uh, if people, unless people have been hiding on the rock, they would know that uh, Marvel Movie Studios is coming out with uh, the Black Panther uh, movie. Um, yes, that Black Panther, uh, not to be confused with the Black Panther Party for some events, although there's some connection. Um, <laughs> but the official character of the Black Panther, the movie's coming out. Um, a lot of folks are super excited about this and what the Black Panther represented uh, for them, this like fictional character. And a lot of it's, um, uh, Wakanda is the, the fictional African nation that Black Panther is the ruler of, who's a superhero too. Um, and it's the most advanced nation on the earth in the Marvel universe. Um, and so there you enter like Afrofuturism. Um, that future basically being like, uh, people also call it like the Black Speculative Arts Movement. Uh, it's a, a arts and culture movement that's just like projecting Black people to the future and how important that is. Cause a lot of sci-fi didn't have Black people in it, right? So we're not in the future. Uh, what does that mean for you as a group of people? Uh, so Afrofuturism about reversing that is also about centering a lot of indigenous knowledge, but also at the same time, talk about the, talk about the future, blah, blah, blah. We, um, a friend of ours, uh, Calvin Williams, um, another friend, Rafael from um, Mobilized Immigrant Vote, and Aisha Schillingford and myself, Intelligent Mischief, we came together and we had this idea of like, well, is there a way to tap into this excitement, right? Um, and get people mobilizing using this fictional narrative and the first thing we thought about was um a lot of folks are going to try to organize movie screenings uh like primarily mostly black mostly movie screenings so it was like well it'd be a cool way we could like just coordinate those folks and get people to see each other so we created right. a facebook page and we create wakanda con and we were saying like this is like a con this is like a comic con with like people all going to like the movie theaters people are dressing up and so forth a lot of people are relating it to it's probably the it's actually the only this is why people made this connection. Eddie movies, Eddie, Eddie Murphy's movie, Coming to America, um, which also was like an uh, African ruler of a fictional nation. Um, Black Panther is the second movie to ever probably depict that on a big screen. Um, so people, there's a group in Oakland called Coming to Wakanda, and they're throwing Afrofuturist parties that are mixing the themes of both movies. So we've been connecting different groups cross country called WakandaCon, and we're hoping to, um, sometime next year, around this time next year, to actually have an actual con, to actually do a comic con, but based on Wakanda, but have it be Afrofuturist, bring people together with like activists and cosplayers and engineers and really talk about Afrofuturism through the lens of like Wakanda. Can we like, can we make that real? And what does that mean for us in reality? Um, Rebecca's insisting that I ask you, what will you wear? Oh, <laughs> I was thinking of going simple, but, you know, I, I had, I had, first I have like a very stylish multicolored daishiki I might put on. Uh, I have a brother, you know, it, that's, that's how it fits on me. Um, but it's got to have flashing lights built flash, into it. Oh, it, that's going to, uh, it's all going to be on there. The flashlights <laughs> underneath it. I have a, a daishiki inspired suit that uh, a friend of a friend of mine is in Oakland is thinking about designing. Uh, I might even just have a t-shirt that we plan to put out that just has like the names of the different rulers of Wakanda uh going down you know nice, nice. Multiple, multiple things multiple things <laughs> um all right so i'm uh we have some other questions from uh folks around the country and around the world here um <laughs> and i'm gonna ask you let's see how do you collaboratively evaluate and reflect on the process and outcomes of a project to maximize the insights right and they mm. um specifically asking if you have exercises, facilitation exercises to get the most out of those failures. So mm -hmm. how would you judge a failure and how do you get the most out of a failure basically? And mm -hmm. thank you, John, for that question. Most out of a failure, I would say like, um, 
most of our failure is just, I mean, mostly for us, that that's just been like, so there was one point, the first test, we, we tested out um, the Black Lives Survival Store a year before we had the exhibit at the uh, Boston University. And um, it, we was putting it together. We tested at the Design Studio for Social Intervention. Um, and we had a captive audience there. And then we was going to test it on the street. And we started to think about that, actually started like kind of pre-testing it. Uh, we was running into like, um, it wasn't so much failure, but it was like the problems. By testing, we started realizing what some issues that might come up because we were designing questions in a way that weren't, it was outside the realm of satire and people were coming. We had certain questions that were like, what's your black problem? And people have real black problems. and people's coming to us with real things and not that we should but we had set up in a way where we was like we're not qualified to like counsel people like this right so oh. we, we should be careful about this right and so we was like okay let's change how we think of it because at that point it was the black supply it was the black white survival agency and then we changed it to a store where we could sell the products and then engage with people and think about the products but we didn't want to like uh engage people in actual counseling because we like we're not we're not qualified to do that right and so you know it, so there's not like an that exercise yet comes up that confusion comes up so often of like we're dealing with real people's problems and there's a sort of um there's a certain amount of agency or um uh like you need to be healthy enough to fight mm -hmm. and i always feel like i'm ready when you're ready to fight but mm -hmm. if you're not ready to fight and you need counseling and stuff, I'm probably not the best person. Right, right. And, and you know, it's like we, that's why it's also important. You know, a lot of stuff, a lot of people made a lot of advances in incorporating like healing and healing practices into movement spaces. And, and those are important, a whole area of separate spaces, but we need to know, to recognize what's the separation. And then like, you know, we, we should partner with people who do that. And we should recognize yeah. what's our limits. It's so, right. And don't don't like uh, give people false hope or false promises, you know. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, yeah. We, what we took from that, we do a lot of like after we t just prototype and test things, we do a lot of self evaluation. We have meetings to go forth, and we're like, hey, this came up. How did this make you feel? Like we go through kind of like the senses, like, okay, what? Well, how can we think about this and re readjust it? Um, so I don't have necessarily um, exercises to throw out the people, but we do like a lot of like thorough self-evaluation. That's that's the whole entire point of prototyping. Prototyping is like, it's not, it's not your final product yet. You have to like test it and test it and test it until you come to a point where you feel like, okay, now this thing is good. I think that's a good distinction too, of like that you want your failures in the development process, the prototyping process, not in the final reaching the audience part, right? By mm -hmm. then, you'll hopefully have encountered all the failures and adjusted, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. We've got another one here. Um, this is a. I, I'm just going to throw this at you for the challenge of it. Um, this is Randy, and they're in Atlantic City, and they say, "I work with an organization tackling the homeless issue. Can you share some ideas about how to use design thinking to tackle stigma around homelessness?" Mm. It's like a quiz. Cool. <laughs> no chance to prepare for this. <laughs> uh, with that, especially because the uh, Randy used the word stigma, to me that makes me think of narrative design, right? And and what what's, what stigma is? Stigma is a, a a negative narrative that's stuck to a group of people, right? Also like stereotype. So yeah, it's kind of, that's different from um from like you know physically doing action or just providing a service right if there's a stigma attached to it um then like it's not going to be effective so it's like how do you change the narrative um a lot of stuff that we use from that you know we, we we've done a lot of partnership with um, center for story-based strategy uh we also developed stuff for us how we developed the book we did the process of world building right so these are all things about narrative design like how do you design your world how do you think about narrative and we and we come from the point of view that like human beings see the world um through story so it's like what's the different ways to change the story about people what's the experience that people have with that with those group of people that they have a stigma about right so you, you have to like start start from there you have to break down like okay what's the story about homelessness right what's the story you 
have that you want to change about homelessness? Uh, what, how then do you bring that story to light? Right? What's the different medium you want to use? What's the different experiences you want people to have? And, and what's the process to go through with that? I think those are great questions that somebody could spend a day like answering each one. Um, <laughs> when you say world building, I mean, Steve and I talk a lot about um, you know, imagining success or imagining this utopic world. When, are you are, are those things related? Like, are you actually building out like what the world looks like once you have achieved what you're hoping to achieve? Yeah, yeah. We have an exercise that we we have people use world building to basically create their vision. Uh, we find like a lot of ways that organizing is taught today. Um, it doesn't include people having actual like end goal vision, right? It's like just fix this immediate problem, fix this next yeah. immediate problem, and just keep doing that, right? Yeah. And hopefully one day things will be good. Um, so we say like, part of that is like having lack of vision, which means you have a lack of story that you're telling to able to win people over. So world building is exercise that like um, people write novels, people write comics, people write um, movies used to develop the whole world. So it's not just a story. It's not just that story on the screen. That story is backed by you actually sit back and you go, what's the logic of this world? Does this world have gravity? What is that you could totally create wherever you want, right? Like, why do people use this slang word instead of this slang word in the story? That you have to create a whole background story to that. What's the what's the belief system in this world? So we did that for um, the Black Lives Survival Guide and we came up with like the agents. Right? A lot of people don't know, they usually just see the tips and products, but it's actually the background story is that there's a free black nation called Nation X uh, in, in the West somewhere, we won't let people know, um, that actually, for centuries has been sending black agents to go and free black people uh, in the West. So like Harry Tubman, Malcolm X, um, um, uh, oh man, so but uh, anybody yeah. else you can think of, <laughs> they've all yeah. been like secret agents that are sent from uh, this Nation X to come free black folk. And the, the latest agents wrote this book uh, because there's been an opening in the veil through all the social movements that are happening. And so they was like, oh, the movements need a guide. Let's create this book that help people guide, guide through it. It's really like a secret communications that's happening. So when I first started like studying art stuff, I came into it through film. And one of the exercises that you do when you're like writing a story for screenwriting or something, it's like every character, there'll be like 50 or 100 questions that you answer about that character that, you know, very few of those things might actually literally make it into the story mm -hmm. but you know the the like who the relationship that person has with their uncle and like how far they got through school and like where they went to preschool and how they felt about it and like how many times they moved and all these things that then inform the parts that the audience does see and mm -hmm. that's sort of what you're describing is like you have a whole universe or world that you've created that people get to glimpse. Yep. And that makes your work stronger. Yeah, when we first started writing the book, we, um, it was just becoming, it was becoming hard, difficult to just figure out how to write it. And then we actually started being like, we have to build this world out. And we sat down and we created, we wrote out the world and then it became so much simpler to like, write the book, write the narrative in the book, write the tips. And so then we was like, yeah, this is a tool that we can help people use to develop direct actions. Like your direct actions should be telling you, should be displaying the world you want to see, right? And since the world we want to see doesn't exist and probably has not existed on a global scale ever, right? We're making it up. So if you could build your world in your mind, you could build it in real life, you know? And that, that's the part of like creating like a, liber a culture of liberation. This is why I admire libertarians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they they do do this so well. So I know, and they admit that little island that they're gonna build where they can be yeah. Palestinians, like yeah, top guys, <laughs> and assuming <I> guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's so true. Me, I'm dumb, but <laughs> it's like no, yeah, libertarians use very much a male centered movement. <laughs> well, they have Aunt Ayn Rand. Yeah, she was the only, only one. Who, who else can you think of? 
<laughs> I don't know, but they did put her in a position of leadership, so we'll give them that. <laughs> you give them um, too much credit. Too much credit. <laughs> so we have a few more minutes. Um, we've covered most of it, but I have a note here about coworker.org. What is coworker.org? Cool. Code.org, that is an organization, primary online organization that organizes workers in um, sort of like the the gig economy and also uh, new sectors of work that have low union density. And they're, they're, helping, orga they're helping workers self-organize. Uh, they are right now a client of ours who we're partnering with to develop a project uh, using culture to organize low-income workers. And what we are doing, we are writing a comic book uh, for them. Uh, so they're wow. an excellent organization. I think they have over 400,000 members um, in the organization, um, showing that it's possible to organize these these new type of workers. And we're hoping to use the experiment of creating a comic book that would help them uh, prove this. So all the task rabbit workers and the Uber and Lyft drivers like can communicate with each other and collect collectivize basically. Yep. Yep. And you're making the comic for that. Yep. That's a good job, man. I like that. <laughs> yes, um, very fun job. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we're gonna wrap up. Is there anything else you that I forgot to mention that we should mention? Um, no. Just you know, let people know what Conda Con. Um, organize your your all black movie showing uh, February fifteenth, February sixteenth. Uh, go oh, to Conda Con Facebook. <laughs> um, all black to organize the all black movie showing. Uh, no, maybe it might help. Might help a bit. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> um, we're we're gonna start doing um, intelligent mischief uh, sort of uh, podcast webinar type things uh, in early February. So look on our our website, look on our Facebook page actually to find out about that. And uh, we're participating with a sense of story based strategy to do a sort of post Black Panther uh, online webinar. Cool. Um, Rebecca is posting links for all these things. Um, I have a couple of things for couple of things for us, which is um, we haven't had you on the Pop Culture Savage Expeditions yet, but we should. I know. Um, I, yeah. love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So the Pop Culture Savage Expeditions is a podcast that Steve, Steve Duncombe and Pat Gerido and I do. Yes, as I said that right. And um, we do very popular things, and then in you know, of course, we could just trash them. Like, you know, this time we went to brunch. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, which I was like, this is just an excuse for like fancy people to get drunk during the middle of the day. That's like, and gossip with each other. That's socially acceptable. But there's a bit more to it. And instead of just trashing it, we try to figure out what's valuable and how we can use it for activism. And one of our, our, um, our listeners and a current someone who is on this webinar in attendance, I've seen David Hart edited this podcast for us, which enabled us to do another one after a long time of not being able to do that. So that's on, in our podcast feed. If you search for podcasts or pop culture salvage expeditions in your podcast app, you can get it. And there's 10 other episodes also. Um, the other thing is this is your last chance before the end of the year to donate to the Center for Artistic Activism. And if you donate, on a regular, I think it's $10 or more a month or a $25 donation, um, you get this print, which is uh, of the Suffragette Parade on Washington. So do you know about this, Terry? Yes, so, no. So in like 1913, they're campaigning to, um, to have, allow women to vote. And they dressed up as like these Greek goddesses because all the all the DC buildings look like, you know, temples. And they're the god. I, I like to imagine that they're the goddesses of democracy. And they like rode in on horses, all wearing white, wow. and had these pageants with girls with balloons and staged this massive sp spectacle at the beginning of when photography, yeah, you know, the very beginnings of photography. So they're like thinking about how to create an image and, and a viral image basically Wow! Uh, in the early 1900s. So we made a print of this and added the little Imagine Winning, which is something we talked about a lot today. Um, and so there's, a, I think there's, there might be less than 20 of these left. So I'll, that's the URL. 
<laughs> and as a board member, you get one, Terry. So you don't have oh. to off right now. Um, but I think, oh, here's Terry's info. We've also put it in the chat, uh, those links in the chat. You've got Intelligent Mischief. People can follow you on Twitter and Instagram. There's good stuff there. And um, I think that's it, right? That is it. So thank you again, Terry. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll see you at the next board meeting. Yep. <laughs> you oversee our activities. And, exactly. um, and thanks for everybody for tuning in on this um, holiday kind of weird week in between. Um, our next podcast, our next, oh gosh, tired, webinar. Our next <laughs> webinar is Rebecca. Tell me, next webinar is coming up. It's going to be good. We've actually, we're talking to a bunch of different people. We're trying to get, uh, oh, she says, we'll be announced soon. Our next <laughs> webinar will be announced soon. So we've got some good people. I'm trying to work on one about professional wrestling. Um, yeah. And uh, and I'm, we're also trying to get uh, some folks from improv everywhere. And wow. All that stuff is in the works. There's a lot of good ones coming up. But it's a secret right now, so I shouldn't talk about it. So, um, Terry, thank you again. My hat's off to you. And um, and I'll see you soon. Cool. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.